few years ago. Mm -hmm. We did a Bible study here um, talking about Robert Anderson's book, The Coming Prince. And somebody had asked me to um, kind of put some notes together about it. And so a few years later, here we are. I'm going to share a few notes about it. Um, so Robert Anderson, The Coming Prince, wrote this a long time ago. He was uh, he was a guy that lived in the uh, mid to late 1800s and uh, he wrote this book. He was he was a guy that worked at Scotland Yard mm -hmm. and he was a detective and so in his spare time he used to write Christian books mm -hmm. on prophecy and things like that. And um, so it's an interesting book. It's pretty detailed in, in it's like a mathematical kind of book um, a lot of adding and subtracting of dates and placing placing things on the calendar but uh, in reading the preface the preface uh, has some interesting notes in it so uh, one of the things he says is faith is not the abnegation of reason but the highest act of reason to maintain that such proof is impossible is equivalent to asserting that God the God who made us cannot so speak to us that the voice shall carry with it the conviction that it's from him. And he goes on to say, The reign of creeds is past. The days are gone forever when men will believe what their fathers believed without a question. Orthodoxy in the old sense is dead. And if any are to be delivered, it must be by a deeper and more thorough knowledge of the scriptures. And these pages are but a humble effort to this end. But if they avail in any measure to promote the study of Holy Writ, their chief purpose will be fulfilled. So really, he's just saying that the purpose in writing this book is really to steer people back to Scripture and study of the Bible so that he can, so that uh, they can have their faith planted on a more firm foundation. And we see that again in Scripture where uh, Paul is talking about the, the Bereans where he says they received the word with all eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. so. Okay, so what is the book about? What is The book talks about a period in uh, Jewish history uh, during the Babylonian exile mm -hmm. and what happens afterwards. And it, it counts um, the time between that Babylonian exile and the time that Jesus appears. Okay. So let's just run through a little bit of that history. So here's a map of modern day of the modern day Middle East. We can see Israel over here and Iraq. And these are the two principal places that uh, that we talk about in the book. So we have Jerusalem over here on one side. And over here we have where Babylon would have been. And you can uh, see that's about 50 miles south of Baghdad. You can see it up there in the north. Okay. And so this, um, this happened under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. So he was the king of Babylon, and uh, we have Egypt over here. And so what was going on during the time, these were kind of the two superpowers. You had Babylon on one side and Egypt on the other, mm -hmm. and they were vying for um, space and territory, and Israel found itself in the middle, and they were uh, fought over territory. So they were, they were um, going to be the vassal state of either Egypt or Babylon. And at this time had... Israel already broken into? Yes, yeah, so this okay. is... During, and Jerusalem was in the south? Jerusalem was in the south part of mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, the nation of Judah, and okay. Israel would have been to the north. And so at this point, Israel has already been dispersed. God has already judged them. And so we're coming up on the judgment of the southern kingdom. And uh, nobody believed it was going to happen. So they believed that they were God's chosen people. They were never going to be the vassal state of anybody. They were never going to go into exile. Uh, but what happens is Nebuchadnezzar comes and he lays siege to Jerusalem. And so I've got first siege here. This is one of many that, uh, that they go through. And during that first siege, what he does is he takes away um, just some of the people around the king, so some of the court and some of the high officials and things like that, takes a token bunch of people back. And this happens in 606 BC. Mm -hmm. 
And so among those was Daniel. Daniel was one of the people in the king's court, and he ended up going into exile in Babylon during that first siege. Hmm. So they have a second siege, but the one we're going to focus on here is the third siege. And so what happens is, is because of that tension between Egypt and Babylon, they, uh, they, they keep fighting over it, and, uh, and Israel kind of keeps breaking its promise to Babylon. They keep promising to send tribute and money, and that's kind of what a vassal state does. But they, uh, they keep breaking that and not sending the tribute. And so Nebuchadnezzar keeps coming back, laying siege. But this time he's finished with that whole thing. Rather than just taking a token, he levels the whole city. And he takes everyone to Babylon. And leaves only a few poor people and things like that. You know, kind of the dregs of society or, or all that's left there. There's no, there's no city to speak of. And that happened around 589 BC. So with these two cities, we have Daniel um, that's living in Babylon, in the palace in Babylon. And at the and about 70 years on, he's reading in uh, some of the texts that the prophet Jeremiah had, had written. He says, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord, to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So he's reading what Jeremiah had written to these kings before the exile began. Jeremiah's no longer living, right? No, this, so this is after, he's, he was kind of during the sieges, and so Daniel was a young man when he came in, and now he's an old man. Okay. And, uh, and so he's reading the text that Jeremiah had written, and uh, and determining, hey, he said we we're only going to be captive for 70 years, and we're coming up to the end of that. And so Jeremiah, uh, and incidentally, there's a there's a good movie out there if you want to see what was going on during that whole siege. They they played it very well. Patrick Dempsey being Jeremiah in that movie. And if uh, you're into watching movies, there's a good movie about Daniel as well that you can see on Netflix. So. Um, but this is what Jeremiah wrote. He said, This country will be, an, uh, will be as empty as a desert, because I will make all of you the slaves of the king of Babylonia for 70 years. So this was 70 years ago, and now Daniel's reading this. And, uh, and uh, so what we get is that Daniel is taking this um, piece of text very seriously and taking Daniel as, as a prophet seriously. And... Uh, so with this text, the key part is this 70 years. And uh, so what Robert Anderson does in this book is he says, okay, so we have, we have this prophecy that Jeremiah wrote, and time has passed, so we're able to corroborate whether or not scriptures are um, accurate and reliable and things like that. So um, he takes this 70 years, and he multiplies it by 360 days a year. So the first question generally that comes up here is... Why 360? Why 360 days a year? Mm -hmm. And he goes into great lengths as to why we would use 360 days to calculate that in his book. Mm -hmm. um, but just to paraphrase all that, it's largely for consistency for all the prophecies going through the Bible. They use 360 day years. And... Um, as an example, at the very end in Revelation, when they're talking uh, about prophetic things, they mention that, that this period of time of three and a half years is 1260 days. Um, and it's, it's referred to as 42 months, it's referred to as three and a half years. So we have that same period of time um, talked about as different lengths, different in, in different terms, but it's the same length of time. So if we take 1,260 days and we divide that by 3.5 years, we get 360 days sitting here. So um, I get the short answer to that is that it's just for consistency throughout the Bible. Okay. So if you multiply that out, you get 25,200 days in 70 years. 
So now that we have that information, we can kind of go back to history and say, okay, they started that first siege in 606 BC. Mm -hmm. Now with this first part, there's no, Robert Anderson doesn't definitively give a start date like a specific day. Um, So he just gives a range of a year of when that would have taken place. So starting in 606, um, that was under Nebuchadnezzar, but now... At this point in history, when Daniel's reading this, this is Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. So we've gone through a couple kings, uh, still the Babylonian Empire. And, uh, and that's where we get this scene. You can see the picture here where you get that handwriting on the wall. Nebuchadnezzar's grandson is, is throwing a party to thumb his nose at, the, at, the, at Cyrus, the, the, the kind of the up-and-coming guy in the area. This Belshazzar. He sees this handwriting on the wall. He asks Daniel to come in and interpret it, and the interpretation is that your kingdom's over, and the new guy is coming in, and that's Cyrus, Cyrus the Great. So we see there's a, a transition of kingdoms here. We're going from the Babylonian to the Medo-Persian Empire starting. And tradition holds that when Cyrus shows up, um, in Babylon, he's greeted by Daniel, who presents him with the scroll of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was written about 200 years before this event ever happened, hmm. but he's mentioned here specifically by name by the prophet Isaiah, who lived in the northern kingdom um, in Israel. Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. That would have been quite something for Cyrus to see, don't you think? See, I think so. That, see his own name in the scriptures. That would have, um, that would probably uh, shake you a little bit. And keeping in mind when Isaiah wrote that, that Jerusalem was standing and the temple was standing. So um, to prophesy that it's going to be rebuilt before it's ever destroyed is, is, uh, is something as well. But as history shows, it all came to pass. So Cyrus says um, to the Jews, you can go back. Uh, He gives them all financial incentives to go back. This happened in 536 BC. Only about 5,000 families take them up on it and go back. The rest are fairly established in Babylon. They're settled and they're going to stay. But this small group goes back. Uh, in 536 BC. So now we have two dates, two years, 606 to 536, and that is what Robert Anderson refers to as the servitude of the nation. He was kind of the first to kind of divide that up. Most people said that 70 years was just one specific length of time, Um, but he broke it up into two. So that servitude was 70 years, as Jeremiah predicted. Mm. But we had a couple of sieges, so this other one, now because there was a feast going on and mentioned in the Bible, he pegged that to a, a specific date. And he uses all the, the Hebrew calendar dates, and you can get into that if you want to read the book. Um, and this is later on, we have Darius, uh, who was another king in the Medo Persian Empire, and he writes an edict that. Uh, the foundation of the second temple can be laid. They had a lot of trouble going back to Jerusalem because it was full of people who weren't from around there. They didn't want the temple to be reestablished. They didn't want Jerusalem to be reestablished. So it took a few decrees to get this thing going. Um, But this decree laid the foundation for the second temple. And that decree was on the state, the 24th of Chislu, 520 BC. All the dates that I'm using are are from uh, Robert Anderson's book. So um, there have been people that come along that kind of revise the dates and, and things, but these are all the original ones from the book, and uh, uh, people have gone and revised it later on. What does Chislu mean? Is that Tibet and Chislu? Those are, those those are months. Yeah. Months. Yeah, in the Jewish calendar. But you don't know what they would correspond to in, yep. our, in our calendar. Yeah, well, not off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, they do correspond to specific dates on our calendar. Um, I'm just, I've just pulled these right out of the book. Okay. And so what you get when you uh, 
go from one date to the other here. This is this this span of time was called the desolations of Jerusalem, because the the city wasn't destroyed until later on in this in this uh, uh, during the third siege, and it's not restored until after. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have two periods of time, and that the the distance or the 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 amount of time between those two dates is twenty five thousand two hundred days which is what we calculated before, right? 70 years. Mm. So we have two periods of time of 70 years. And so just to kind of map that out for you, we'll stick that on a timeline here. You have that first part, the servitude of the nation, 70 years, and this desolations of Jerusalem, another 70 years, or 25,200 25, days. So they both have a start and end point on that timeline, but they overlap somewhat. And the gap that you have there at the beginning, uh, because we don't have a definitive date for the start of the servitude of the nation, it's, it's about 16 to 17 years. And at the end, because they're the exact same amount of time, it's still about 16 to 17 years. Hmm. That's interesting. Right? Is that so, going to be important later in the discussion? Yeah, we'll bring that up again. Okay. But, but I guess what what's interesting here to me is that we've gone through two kingdoms and three kings. Nebuchadnezzar started both of these, right? Mm -hmm. But both of them are specifically seventy years. Now, if that if that was just one length of time, you know, it started and ended. It was seventy years long. Um. You could call it a contrivance and just say coincidence, or yeah, that or that that Daniel was a friend of the king, and that they said, "Hey, we read this prophecy. Let's just make it come true Sounds by like you. by writing this uh, this decree and edict as a celebration on the 70th anniversary, and we're going to send you all back." Right. And uh, you know, you could call it a contrivance, but because. Um, it's through two different kingdoms, and it's three different kings. It's a lot harder to imagine that just being contrived, that, and, and that there's two overlapping time periods that God is giving judgment for. One is the servitude of the nations, and the one is the desolations of Jerusalem. That they're both 70 years long um, points more to God's hand being in it, him speaking through his prophet, and then uh, having it come to pass in, in recorded history. So that, that overlapping part and that little thumbprint you have of 16 to 17 years is, uh, is, is important because God says one thing, it's, it's that they are in the hand of God, not in the hand of some other nation mm -hmm. at the whim of some other nation, they're, they're at God's whim. This was published in 1894, Robert Anderson. So later on, people have taken his work and, uh, and it's been used, it's been a, a foundational piece of prophecy since it was published. Um, one of the people who has uh, taken his work and, and reworked it has been the Koinonia Institute. And uh, they've set specific dates for the servitude of the nations and, and, and found it to be 25,200 days, just like the desolations of Jerusalem. So the dates they set on it uh, were slightly different than what Robert Anderson had originally calculated. But because we had specific dates at the start and end of them, we have a specific gap as well. So 6,963 days at the beginning and 6,963 days at the end because they're both the exact same length of time. Okay. So that becomes interesting because um, another thing that was going on during this whole thing is that Ezekiel was a prophet that was a contemporary with all these guys. He was living in Babylon, but he was uh, not living in a palace with Daniel. He was living amongst the people. Okay. 
and uh, and if you go through his writings, he acts out a lot of of prophetic things that mm -hmm. God was speaking to the people. And so one of the things that he wrote during this time is this. He says, this is a sign for the house of Israel. Then lie on your left side and place the punishment of the house of Israel upon it. For the number of days that you lie on it, you shall bear their punishment. So this is prophetic that, that there's this punishment coming for the house of Israel. And for I assign you a number of days, 390 days, equal to the number of years of their punishment. So long shall you bear the punishment of the house of Israel. So the information we're getting out of this is that, first of all, days are years. The number of days, and he wouldn't lay on his side like for the whole day. It would just be a certain time for the day for a set amount of time. He would lay on his side to speak prophetically to the people. Okay. So, um, so we're getting days are years. He's going to do this for 390 days. And Israel gets 390 days, and then he goes on and says, And when you've completed these, you shall lie down a second time, but on your right side, and bear the punishment for the house of Judah. Forty days I assign you, a day for each year. So a similar pattern, we get another 40 days for Judah. And this is that divided kingdom, Israel and Judah. Judah in the south, Israel in the north. Exactly. Okay. So we've got 390 plus another 40. So in total... 430 days he's doing this for 430 years of punishment that they're due, right? And they've just gone through 70, 70 years. So we're going to take that off. We get 360 years. Let's clear the board here. So we've got 360 years, but there's also this other scripture in Leviticus that says, that If you will not be reformed by me, by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then I will also walk contrary unto you, and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins. So they get through the 70 years. Right. God asks, if you're still walking contrary to me, then I'll walk contrary to you. And they get time seven on that, on what's left. And that gives you... 2,520 years we're still talking about, right? But what does walk contrary unto you mean? If the punishment has corrected them. In whatever to... way God was. Exactly. Okay. 2,520 years. So we'll go back to our similar way of calculating this out. We multiply that by 360 days, and we get this gargantuan number of 907,200 days. So what happens when we add that on to these um, to these two judgments, these two timelines, the servitude of the nation and the desolation of Jerusalem? Um, we we'll get a very, very interesting date. We get May 14th, 1948, the mm -hmm. day when Israel became a nation. David Ben-Gurion proclaims Israel to be a nation. Mm -hmm. And if we add that on to the desolations of Jerusalem, we get the Six-Day War when Israel retakes Jerusalem for the first time. They weren't, uh, they weren't in control of it before then. And so June 7th, 1967 is the second date that we come up with if we add that time on. And if you reject, you kind of put all that aside and you reject it, you still get a very interesting 6,963 days as a gap between two, those two. So even if you reject all that calculation, mm -hmm. you still kind of have that little thumbprint on it to say, um, you know, that, that gap links it back to these two judgments. Mm -hmm. Wow. So if you... If you, if you disregard any of the new dates and the new uh, work that people have done on it. Even in Robert Anderson's original work, there's still something very interesting that comes out. You know, the order is right, first of all. Israel becoming a nation first, so that servitude of the nations part coming first without Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Jerusalem coming second, retaking Jerusalem. And the gap is still about right. You know, with Robert Anderson, it was 16 to 17 years, and uh, and this 6,963 days is roughly 19 years. So, 
to have that size of a gap even between those two events um, still puts God's thumbprint on it, that uh, he is in control, he's the one um, mm-hmm. that's establishing the nation, and he's the one that uh, is giving them Jerusalem again. Interesting. So that was the part of the book that's, uh, that's less used, I guess. This next part is the one that you hear used a lot by prophetic um, scholars and and uh, and referred to a lot more, more so because uh, the dates are a lot more solid. So we're still back in Babylon and Jerusalem, and we go down a few more years. We've got Artaxerxes Longimanus, and Who is he's, he? he's the next, um, a, f- a few kings after the ones we've been talking about. Okay, after so Darius. We're still in the in the Medo Persian Empire. Okay. And uh, they still have not rebuilt the temple and still haven't really reestablished Jerusalem. They've just, there's just been too much local opposition. And so... Local opposition? In Jerusalem. Because as all the Jews were moved out during the... Uh, other people moved in. Other people moved in. And they didn't want that reestablished. Okay. So, um, but as this goes, as this part of, of history goes... Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king here, and uh, and he was distressed that they couldn't reestablish uh, the city, and he gets um, written authorization from the king to rebuild the city, to rebuild the walls, and to reestablish um, Jerusalem as a, a city. And so Nehemiah takes those and goes out to the city and kicks everybody out and starts rebuilding the walls. This happened very specifically on March 14th, 445 BC. And uh, Robert Anderson, with this work, had this date corroborated by the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England. Um, So he had uh, an outside uh, person or organization confirm uh, his date for this. And so that leads us to uh, what Daniel had written later when he uh, had a vision from an angel that spoke to him. This is the angel speaking. It says, you need to realize it from the command to rebuild Jerusalem until the coming of the chosen leader. It will be seven weeks and another 62 weeks. Streets will be built in Jerusalem and a trench will be dug around the city for protection, but these will be difficult times. So again, he's giving a mathematical, um, a, a predictable prophecy here. There's a starting point to it, the command to rebuild Jerusalem, and there's an end point until the coming of the chosen leader. Meaning who? The Messiah? That's, that's their Messiah okay. that they're waiting for. And so we're told it's going to be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So we are we generally think of weeks as seven days, right? But mm-hmm. they have, um, in the Hebrew culture, they have weeks of years. So that would be a group of seven years. We tend to group ours by ten, so we would say a decade. Um, but they would group them by in sevens and call them weeks. Seven weeks equals seven years in their vernacular. Yes, so they would have weeks of days, but they would also have weeks of years. And so this prophecy is speaking weeks of years. Okay. So we have seven weeks and 62 weeks. That gives us 69 weeks. Weeks of years. So we're going to take that 69 weeks, multiply that by seven years. So the prophecy is talking about a period of time of 483 years. So we've learned before, we multiply that by 360 days, and we come up with 173,880 days. So we know very specifically what the start date of this was. It says, Daniel says, at the end of the 62 weeks, the chosen leader will be killed and left with nothing. So we've got the start date, March 14th, 445 BC. So all we need to do is add that 
173,800 days to that. And we'll get April 6, 32 AD was the date that the Messiah was to show up. Wow. And that is the date that Jesus presents himself as king in Jerusalem, riding on the back of the donkey, fulfilling prophecy. And does that correspond to Passover, Passover week? Yes, yeah, so that would be wow. the week that Passover is going to begin. Um, and so this is what's written around that. It says, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I mean, they, they figured he didn't want his disciples to be blaspheming by calling him the Messiah or anything like that or right. or or you know this this promised king that was supposed to come this chosen leader um, and Jesus says to them says I tell you if they were silent the very stones would cry out so when he's coming into the city he says and when he drew near and saw the city he wept over it saying would that you even you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. So he's speaking about on this day. This is a very specific day. It's a day that was prophesied that they um, should have been waiting for him. They should have known that it was this was the day that he was coming. Mm. What what do you what do you think is the most significant thing about Robert Anderson's book and these figures? Why is it important for you? to share that with people? Uh, I think it just goes back to what Robert Anderson had written in his preface. I think um, that the reign of creeds is past. That, that, that people will no longer simply believe things uh, because somebody told them to. It if, if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to maintain your faith, it's only going to be because you've done um, some homework in this and you've done, uh, you've, you've mined enough information from the Bible to let your faith rest on something solid. Mm -hmm. And I think the Bible will do that if, uh, if we give it our time and attention. It will... Um, allow us to have a solid faith. And what do you, I mean, there must be critics. Yeah, um, I, I guess I find that interesting that uh, there are critics, there are critics mm -hmm. to what Robert Anderson has written. And uh, uh, the, uh, the interesting thing that I found is that people will take his work and his 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 calculations and things like that, and will say, "Well, he's off a day here, he's off four days here," and uh, because the, the calculation of of dates like this is not it's 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 a lot of work mm -hmm. because the calendar changes so much because. Uh, over over the centuries, it's changed a lot, and days have been skipped here, and then mm -hmm. you just have to be aware of all that. So it's it's a surely, it's a major project. Yes. Okay. Um, Surely, our use of the Julian calendar probably uh, complicates that somewhat. Right, because you're converting to what they were using, and and they date things by kings and feasts and things like that. Um, so there's it's it's not an insignificant bit of work. To, to do something like that. But he goes through it all in the book if, if, if you want to do it. And so the critics would go through and say, well, okay, he, he messed this up and he messed that up. Mm -hmm. And really, a lot of the critics say he's out by five days and he's out by 12 days. And, and that's, that's their basis for rejecting it all. Um, you know, I, in... In the things that I've read, the, the longest I've seen is somebody said that he was out by a year. For me personally, if over 500 years he's out by one year, um, 
I would still tend to think, you know, maybe I missed something. Maybe there's something in my calculations. If, if the Bible prophetically anticipates um, Jesus arriving on a certain day, and, um, and I can get as close as a year just even by a cursory examination of, of the information there, mm -hmm. to me that's pretty compelling and Especially pretty when close. Especially when the date is falling right on Passover, on the, on the year that we believe he was crucified, that's... That's quite powerful, and I think it would be mm, proof in the veracity of the scriptures, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, the even to me, the the critics only being able to move it by about a year is is uh, almost corroborates the work that he's done because they can't move it enough right. uh, to to say that it's all garbage. You right. can only move it a little and say, well, it's not spot on the day, so um, so it's all no good, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So to me, that, that points to me how, uh, how effective his work was and that it is a basis for, uh, for, for our faith that, that the scripture is reliable. Mm -hmm.